I was born and raised here in Bakersfield. I was pretty much raised in the church. Um, my parents were conservative. My dad was hardworking. Um, my mom, she was a housewife. Um, when I was about six years old, maybe five, I can remember my parents telling me I was adopted. I kind of didn't really know what that meant, but I was a pretty smart kid and I figured it out. We had a really good family life. I, I had a really good childhood. Um, as I remember back when I was about four or five years old, um, I was molested um, by some older girls that had lived in the neighborhood. It didn't, it isn't really anything that stuck with me um, until I got older and realized what had happened. And so it kind of, it kind of changed me, I think, a, a little bit as an individual. Um, that along with, um, as I grew older, really, really realizing what um, being given up for adoption was. I did well in high school. Um, I was in student government. I, we got good grades. I got good grades. My brother's sister got good grades. Um, but I got, all, but, but I could always tell I was a little bit different. I always had to have a lot of friends, and I always kind of um, wanted to be the most popular guy. Um, and I would pretty much do whatever I had to do in order to to to, to be that person. And I and I, I realize now, as I look back, I think that. Um, had a lot to do with me being given up for adoption. I had that fear of, of being left alone or being alone or being being abandoned. And so in in my high school years, um, I started drinking um, because it was a thing that, you know, at, at my high school where I felt like I had to do to fit in. I remember in high school, um, I, I started uh, young, working for the recreation department, um, you know, doing, um, scorekeeping and summer job and, and umpiring and refereeing and and I got really involved in, in coaching track and field and, and volleyball um, and I had some success in that um, some really good success in that and um, my, my senior year in high school um, I started using uh, drugs um, it started with cocaine and, and ended with methamphetamine and um, the drugs got in the way of my my uh, working for the rec department and and I was really sad about that because I lost my job coaching volleyball. And um, that was the start of, of my downfall, really, with my drug addiction. Um, the methamphetamine kind of overtook my life. And right after I graduated high school, um, I, I entered um, a rehab called Teen Challenge. Um, I graduated the, the Teen Challenge program. It was a very tough program. Um, but because I grew up in church, um, it was where my family thought I should go. It was where I, you know, thought would be best for me. But uh, after I got out of Teen Challenge, I, I started CSUB as a PE major. I wanted to, I wanted to continue my, uh, my years coaching and things like that. But quickly, um, my life didn't really have any meaning. Um, and so I quickly went back to drugs. <sighs> I mean, I was going to school not really staying in class the whole time, leaving class early, going to do drugs. And, and of course they had a bar on campus and so I wouldn't go drink on campus. And that didn't work out so well. And um, in 1990, I say, is when I first started, 1991 is when I first started getting in trouble with the law. I started selling drugs to support my drug habit. Um, I started going to Laredo. Um, and um, doing time on the farm and then doing time in pretrial. And then I believe it was in 1995 that I caught my first sales charge. Maybe it, was, maybe it was earlier than that because I think in 1995, 96 is the first time I actually went to prison. Um, but before I went to prison, I had went to, uh, I, I, done, I did uh, Frank Hoover's drug court. I did the PC-1000 over on L Street. Um, with a counselor named Lori Slate, uh, fantastic counselor, but um, that's where I started with uh, behavioral services. Um, and you know, the the addiction um, just seemed to go back and forth to me. I'd get some clean time, and and then um, I didn't take recovery serious. But I wasn't serious with any kind of 12-step program or getting any kind of a sponsor. Um, 
I wasn't wasn't serious with hanging around with new people or new friends or, or getting involved in any kind of recovery-based 12-step or anything like that. And so I ended up um, going back and forth to prison, and, and I, I ended up spending about nine and a half years of my life in prison. Um, and um, I ended up hanging around with people that I never would have imagined hanging around. Um, I, I got to where I was robbing houses, stealing cars, carrying guns. Um, I got to where I was staying up for two weeks at a time um, and just doing things that I would never imagine doing. Um, meth had, had um, overtaken my life. I found out that I had uh, hepatitis C from uh, probably the first time I ever used a needle. Um, and so that kind of put a damper on my life a little bit. Um, and I tried treatment for that and it didn't work. It, it, it really took a toll on my body. I, uh, I got a really good job at a staffing agency here in Bakersfield um, as um, an account manager and as a dispatcher as a recruiter putting people to work and uh, that was really really good work for me I was pretty good at it um, a lot of people that came to came to the company that wanted to go to work were people who like were that were like me that had been to prison um, or had been to jail and that, that had you know drug problems and so um, I could relate to them and and, um, I, and I my boss knew that and so it, it was it was kind of a good combination for me um, but I, during the time that I worked there, I, I didn't stop drinking. And the alcohol quickly led back to um, me being in the wrong place at the wrong time and having a weakness. And, and uh, I found out later that um, just because um, we stop using drugs, our brains don't forget um, being in particular places at particular times, uh, what we last did in those places, in those last times. And my, I, I went to an old, an old hangout, and the last thing I had done there was use and sell drugs. And uh, I didn't know, uh, I, I, was, I went there by myself, and, and I quickly remember the last thing I did there, and I quickly relapsed. Uh, and that leads me to 2012. In 2012, um, I, uh, I got really, really heavy into selling drugs again, and, and, and I got involved with an individual, and I started selling a lot of drugs for him, and I, I got busted um, back to back um, with a pretty large quantity of drugs. Um, I had fallen asleep on the side of the road on two separate occasions, um, and um, I had bailed out of jail, and the individual had um, made it made the bail for me the first time and then got mad at me the second time because I had lost a lot of money for him in the, in the end. And so he made it very difficult for me to continue using and buying drugs. And so I ventured out into um, no man's land to try to continue with my habit because that's what a drug addict did. And so one afternoon in May of 2012, I went by myself to make a purchase of, of what I thought was just some drugs. Um, and I was shot five times with a 40 caliber gun. The last thing I remember was leaving my friend's house. And the next thing I remember was waking up in Kern Medical Center after being in a coma for 10 days. And I was told by my family um, and by the, the trauma unit that um, um, I was shot five times on the east side of town and I was medevaced by the helicopter um, to KMC that I had um, that I had died that I had flatlined twice on the right over and once in the trauma unit that I had lost eight pints of blood and that I should not be alive um, the only thing that I know about that afternoon um, is what I was told by um, the people in the hospital. Apparently, um, 
there were two individuals that um, were at the scene of the crime. Um, I was shot at pretty close range, um, and I was pushed down a small ravine, um, and they stole my car and everything that was in my car, and they left me for dead. In the distance, um, there was a man and a woman who had witnessed this, and um, they were hiding where no one else could see. Um, they came to my, and they rushed to my rescue after the, the uh, perpetrators drove off. He was a doctor, and she was a nurse. They performed life-saving techniques on me, and um, to this day, they never came forward. They never told who they were, probably um, just because they probably didn't want to get involved in the whole situation. Um, and, um, you know, um, I, I, I truly believe that God had his, had his hand in the whole situation. Um, I was in the hospital for five weeks, then I went to Health South, um, and they wanted to make sure that I could walk and talk right. Um, and um, I had those two cases pending you know, prior to that um, that I was out on bail for. And they offered me nine and a half years in prison. And I hired one of the most expensive lawyers in town, but still, I don't think that the lawyer had much to do with it. I think that God's hand was still on this. And, uh, the case was pending for about 13 months because of all the injuries I had. And I ended up getting a year in sober living at Jason's retreat. And so I took that year at Jason's retreat gladly. And uh, I also had to do some outpatient at CSO. Um, I lived at Jason's retreat for that year and I, I finished that outpatient at, at CSO. And um, I learned a lot about myself. Um, I stayed completely clean and sober for the 14 months leading to that, leading up to that year at Jason's retreat, and I stayed completely clean and sober at that during that year at Jason's retreat. And afterwards, I, I was involved in the 12 steps. Obviously, um, I did 90 meetings in 90 days, and I um, I got really involved in a church, and I got really involved in a, in a faith-based 12 step, and I worked the steps, and and. Um, I was sitting in a meeting one night, and it, it wasn't an audible voice, but it was a voice. And a voice spoke to me and said, you know, you have a, a lot that you've experienced. You've been doing drugs for 23 years, 24 years, and, you know, you've got a, a criminal record that is a mile long. There's not much that you're going to be able to do in your life except for give back what has been given to you. And so I decided that I was going to look into the Department of Rehabilitation and to CSUB to see about doing the drug and alcohol studies and getting my KDAC. And within a week, it, I mean, it just, I'm getting goosebumps as I talk about it, it just all fell together. The Department of Rehab accepted me, CSUB said, you know, come on in, fill out the application, and, and I was in school. And my first week of school, I was approached by Beverly Rose and Ginny Bell, and they asked me if, if I wanted to do it, start my internship at, uh, at Chase's Retreat, and I said, absolutely. Um, I, I did an internship there for um, approximately 10 months, and on December 1st of 2015, I got hired on as a counselor there, and I've been doing that ever since. Um, Well, for me, I realized that I didn't have a purpose in life. And I realized that if I went to school and I was able to help people out or just give suggestions, and I, I don't like to say advice because I'm, I, I don't walk in anybody else's shoes except for my own. If I was able to just give suggestions or tell my story, and if my story was able to help somebody else, that I, that, that, that I, had a, I now had a purpose in life. And if I could just have a purpose that I haven't had for 
the, the pri- previous 24, 25 years of my life, my life would be different. Um, you know, and, and, and since I've, I've gone through these last, you know, you know, six years, I have, I've realized that, you know, I, I really don't have to change my mind about drugs or alcohol. Because I'll be honest with you, I really like the way meth makes me feel. I really like the way alcohol makes me feel. And I'm probably never going to change my mind about that. But what I have changed my mind about is what happens to me, the consequences that happen to me when I use meth or when, when, I, when I consume a drug. It, it, nothing, nothing good ever happens to me after a certain amount of time. You know, right? Absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, I, I, I talk to the people that I counsel a lot about the third step, and that third step tells you you got to give your will and your life over to the care of this God that you, who, whichever God it is you understand, or this higher power that you understand. And I and I and I try to tell them, dude, that's a huge step. I mean. Do, do you really think that you can do that? And the most, most of them tell me, I don't know if I can do that right now. Okay, okay. So what I decided to do is just turn my drug addiction, my life and uh, of drug use and the life surrounding all of that use over to my higher power, over to God. And if I can do that, which I did, everything else started to change little by little. When I quit using drugs and when I quit using I quit doing the things that surrounded that life of doing drugs. My life started to change. And it seemed to make so much sense to me and, and everybody else that I, that I am able to speak to about it. And, um, you know, they, they, they tell you to, to do things one day at a time. And, and I believe that you need to do recovery one step at a time. Because if you try to do it all at once and you don't get it all at once, we as addicts get really frustrated really quickly. And when frustration hit, hits, or when f- frustration sets in, we do what we, we go back to what we know. And what we know is just to, the, the fact that I, I went through the schooling and the fact that I got my credential and the fact that I'm working in treatment now makes, it, it takes some of the, the idea of the 24 years of the horrific things that I did and doesn't make it so bad anymore because I can use it as, as an example for somebody else's, hopefully, not to go through. I think that we have a problem. I, I, I think that we create many problems as addicts and alcoholics by being so afraid what others are gonna think about us. Um, you know, w- when I go to a meeting or when I you know, go, to, go to some kind of event, I introduce myself as a person in recovery. And the reason why I do, do that is because when, when I introduce myself as an addict or an alcoholic, the first thing that somebody in the room or the first thing that somebody that's not in recovery thinks of me is, oh, this guy's getting ready to steal my purse or this guy's getting ready to rob my house. But if I introduce myself as a person in recovery, the person thinks, oh, this guy's doing something good for himself. When we try to hide the fact that there, that we're in recovery, or that you know we once had a problem, um, I think that we are not giving ourselves enough credit for the choices that we're making and the good that we're doing now for ourselves. Um, everybody knows somebody who has gone through something similar to what I have gone through or what the, the next addict or alcoholic has gone through. Or everybody knows somebody who is probably an addict or an alcoholic that's just not come to terms with the fact that they are. And, and I think that it means a whole heck of a lot when somebody, it takes a whole lot of courage for the individual to, to admit that um, they're doing something about it. Um, and I think that they're going to get more respect from uh, people when they do admit that they're doing something about it or when they can admit that they're doing something about it. Um, and, and, and those are the people that they're going to want in their life anyways. The people that they're, that they're going to get the respect from 
are the people that they're going to want in their lives. The people that are going to down them or frown upon them because, you know, they've been through the problem, they're going through the problem, or because they have the problem, are, are the people that they don't want around them anyways because they're never going to support them regardless of how, how long they have clean or how long they have sober anyways.